16 Problems with Online Virtual Schools, an excerpt from Unschooling to University. Online learning in the past decade has grown exponentially. Our entire education system seems to be moving toward digital teaching. However, I don't think it's the only way nor the best way to go. Children should delay taking online courses for as long as they can, at least until the teen years, and continue instead to learn in the physical, real world. Currently, online learning takes place either in the home, where it is called distance education, not homeschooling, because it is not parent or self-directed, or it takes place in a school. Face-to-face -face relationships are difficult to foster in the digital world, but are critically needed in the teaching learning dynamic. In response to that need, a hybrid of online and face-to-face -face learning called blended learning is gaining popularity. All of the blended learning is school controlled, but some of the instruction takes place directly from a physical classroom and some occurs through online content or correspondence. Online education has some benefits, and we'll talk about those, but it also has challenges. It's certainly not for everyone. My name is Judy Arnell, and I'm an education consultant. I've also written a few books in non-punitive parenting and education. And I'm author of the book in which this excerpt comes from called Unschooling to University. In it, we outline the pathways of 30 children who unschooled anywhere from three to 12 years and were accepted into the universities, colleges, and technical schools of their choices. 10 were in STEM fields, including four engineers. 10 were in humanities and 10 went into the arts. Which is pretty impressive. Um, and we call them the team of 30. And actually about 22 now have graduated their programs. Okay, so let's talk about the disadvantages of online learning. Number one, relationships are difficult to maintain. Online learning only delivers academic content. The physical, social, and emotional needs of the learner go undetected when there is no visual contact between the teacher and the student. Academic content is easy to find anywhere on the internet, but for the best part of school, is the teacher's relationships with students that is missing in online courses, especially when teachers have 300 to 800 students in their virtual classes. The teacher role is that of paid marker or accreditation conferrer, and many teachers have assistants who help with marking. The interaction is mostly one way. As mentioned before, it falls to the parent or even the at-home student to switch to the teaching role the moment the learner needs help. A 13-year-old at home can spend his whole school day on the computer and may learn the names of his teacher and his classmates, but he does not talk to anyone until his parents get home from work. This is isolating and lonely. Children need relationships. Busing. Busing to a school in order to learn online <laughs> is unnecessary. It's a waste of time for the student and it's harmful to the environment. Children need adult attention daily, not parent attention. Third disadvantage, motivation. That's a biggie and it needs monitoring. Successful online education needs structured parental oversight in the home or daily interaction with a teacher or an extremely self-motivated student. 
Very often, none of those scenarios exist. And this is the reason online courses have such a high dropout rate. Teachers are reduced to being pokers and prodders, trying to motivate learners who literally have to teach themselves the online content. This is degrading to the teaching profession. Number four, the learner teaches himself but is constrained by the government agenda. Many online courses have no synchronous live instruction from a teacher. So the experience is no different than students self-teaching by reading text from a screen or a textbook. After reading the assigned screen text or book pages, they churn out short answers, essays, discussion comments, reviews, quizzes, and lab reports to prove they were engaged in the course. There are no oral responses because there is no synchronous interaction. If students have questions, a teacher's email response often comes far too late. And by that time, kids have often figured out the answer or no longer care about it. Or they might search for the answer online. They might watch videos from an education website or from other online teachers not affiliated with their school or they ask a knowledgeable parent. In some cases, they acquire an external tutor. This is not online learning. Whoever is doing the personalized explaining is doing the teaching, and they should be giving the mark in the course, not the school. And if a student teaches himself, he should also mark himself because he knows exactly what he learned. A true online course that is delivered by a teacher is one in which content is indeed read by the student, with the student then interacting with the teacher by phone or synchronous live real-time video feed, which is equal in time to at least half the number of regular classroom instructional hours. Anything less than this means a student is teaching himself or the parent is teaching him outside the constraints of school. Number five, the parent teaches the child but is still constrained by the government agenda. I've learned so many new things by searching and finding answers together with my children. Kids today are products of the instant gratification generation. They want things right away. When my children took online courses, they didn't want to wait days for a teacher's answer. So they asked me, as noted in the previous section, whoever does the explaining is the de facto teacher, regardless of who does the marking. If a book or computer screen cannot adequately explain a concept to your child in a learning style they understand, and you have to supplement the written instructions with your own explanations, your own drawings, your own manipulatives, and further resources, then hey, you're actually teaching the concept and the course. Schools conferring a mark and commenting on the output does not constitute true teaching. If the parent is explaining a concept in a way they know their child will understand, they should also be empowered to bestow the course marks. As the explainer, I don't get paid to teach the course but I do it because I hate to see my child driven to tears by frustration. As a byproduct, my unpaid labor of teaching subsidizes the education industry's love of online courses. One parent <laughs> describes it pretty well. The course states, online education works with students who can work independently without assistance. Hmm. This is the biggest misconception about online education. Those students who succeed have invisible support and assistance at home. I put my daughter in a grade seven English class to help her with accountability. While a teacher did the primary program delivery, I was still very much involved with helping to create schedules, identify deadlines, proofreading, ordering library books, helping with technology such as how PowerPoint worked, figuring out how to split files too big to upload as an attachment and other things. 
I found that I continued to play just an active role as supporting my daughter as I did when I was actually delivering the subject under home education. Only now, I couldn't give her the mark. So if the parent is taking over many of the teacher's duties in a classroom, why not just have the students self-study from textbooks and from videos on the internet and allow parents to assess the work and give the mark as they do in home education. Number six, online learning only tickles two senses. Experiential learning encompasses sight, smell, touch, hearing, and taste, as well as talking and feeling, which all embed learning in the long-term memory portion of the brain. Online learning and textbook learning, the economically efficient methods of delivery, are not the optimum methods for deep learning because they only involve the sense of sight and possibly hearing. Knowledge gained from online learning is present in the working memory, but gets dumped soon after the final exam. It never moves to long-term memory. Pamela Gordon states that, many studies show that we ignore, forget, or misunderstood about 75% of all the words we hear. Anyone who sends an email and has misread it knows what I'm talking about. To get those ideas to stick, people need to make notes and talk to each other about their impressions and reactions. That's why it's so important in adult education to get adults to write their own handouts or at least fill in the blanks. It helps them remember key points. As the brain processes images better than words, it's often helpful to write notes with diagrams, mind maps, or drawings rather than words. Talking about the concept moves information along neural pathways to the brain and takes it from short-term to long-term memory. That's why we often say, you have to teach a concept to really learn it. When Ryan was taking an online high school math course, he was having trouble self-teaching linear equations. Two of his, neither of his, Two older siblings who were attending university close by could help my son with his math. They had forgotten how to do those equations, even though they had taken the same math course less than two years before. Schools try their best to help a child retain information by requiring a written discussion component from each online class. They require a learner to write at least one posting on a new topic and respond to three postings from other students to earn a certain percentage of the course mark. This type of discussion is not the least bit purposeful. Students hate it. They learn nothing because tone and intent is lost. So they do the minimum required and check it off the list and completely forget what they might have written. No learning occurs. Now, even if online courses were adequate for visual and auditory learners, what about the majority of learners? the kinesthetic ones. Many children want to dissect a real frog, not a virtual one. And really, who doesn't remember the familiar smell of formaldehyde? Two of my children couldn't read well from a screen. And some children can't write on a keyboard either, especially for math problems. Many kids need a classroom where the simple act of writing notes helps them remember and a teacher to explain concepts live and in person on a visual board. Then the kids will get up and actively engage physically. Number seven, children need to move. Excessive time spent sitting is not good. For many years, I felt bad that my children were on the computer as much as they were playing video games and learning by reading. I thought that at least if kids went to school, they would move around in the classroom. Well, teachers soon quashed that notion. Children in classrooms spend a lot of their time on their tablets or watching videos of a teacher explaining a concept. Hands-on learning is very much obsolete especially in the junior high and high school years. Then they come home and spend an average of seven more hours a day online, according to the Vanier Institute. 
Where is a balance in their life when the majority of their school day is spent online and then the majority of their off time as well? Increased screen time has detrimental health and social consequences. Continuous viewing causes eye strain and headaches. Even when children request a paper textbook, they often can't access one because schools will not pay for paper copies. Number eight, online kids can't handwrite. <laughs> Many children cannot handwrite anymore because of their ever increasing reliance on keyboards. This handicaps children who use a computer all through their school years, but must write high stakes exams with paper and pencil, slowing them down tremendously. Many professors at post-secondary institutions will not allow computers in their rooms for exams or even lectures. This means kids who never handwrite will be forced to do so for timed exams and lose marks because of this physical disability. Number nine, virtual schools require technology support. It's not the role of teachers or parents to provide technology repair, upgrades, and computer troubleshooting. But as more schools go digital, funding for the maintenance of technology becomes more important. Even internet access is now an essential service for educational institutions, and the debate rages on as to who should pay for it. 10. Technology creates errors. Computers are machines. They can't use discretion when they mark online exams. Learners must get the short answer exactly correct with the right characters, capitalization, and spacing, as their work is often computer marked and the program is designed to receive only a specific prescribed response. A teacher with 60 kids in her class cannot look for discretion in answers that are indeed correct, but may be worded differently than what the computer is programmed to accept. Kids may never even know that a correct response was incorrectly marked wrong, as schools will not release marked exams to students to use as a learning tool. Schools are concerned that children will copy digital exams for their friends. This doesn't help a child learn. Number 11, parents are shut out of their children's education. Of even more concern is the fact that ever more of their children's day will become invisible to parents. It's easy to open a textbook or binder to see what a child's doing or learning in school, but it's much harder to log into a website with the child's password, if the parent's lucky enough to have it, when the child can so easily change it. Many parents do not have the ability to navigate a website and they remain locked out of their children's work and marks. One school board I know will not even allow their administrators to communicate with parents outside of their own website. The parents must log in to access the teacher and discuss their child's progress. The teachers are not allowed to send private emails or phone parents. This is wrong. Firewalls, compatible software, and passwords all contrive to isolate parents from their own child's education. In spite of all the research supporting the fact that children do better academically when their parents are actively involved. Number 12, online education shifts costs from the school to the learner. Many schools now require students to bring their own laptop to school, but the initial cost of laptops is only the beginning. Kids lose and damage memory sticks, they'll be dropped, lost and stolen laptops. They'll get infected with viruses. Who pays for ongoing tech support when children cannot load videos or exams because of incompatible software? Who pays for help in upgrading software? Who pays for lost or damaged headphones and microphones? Who pays for technology troubleshooting? Will the school offer orientation sessions to parents to support the learner with hardware, software, and networking and of course textbook companies now want to provide online textbooks think of their cost savings as an ebook author i know that printing is a fraction of the cost of book production 
In addition, there are writing, editing, and layout costs, but the ebook cost savings are rarely passed on to the consumer. Rather, the non existent printing costs are still being passed on to parents. Just as businesses shift the cost of printing bills to consumers, charging them if they want to receive a paper bill, parents are also expected to bear the costs of the electronic tools to educate their children. If parents accept the financial burden of providing electronics, they should have choice in where the content comes from. And it may not be the government or the school. Which brings us to number 13, poor online content. Even though there's no excuse for outdated content in digital courses, they are designed by humans and humans make errors. Factual errors, spelling errors, grammatical errors, and editing errors. Sometimes content is really bad. Number 14, online courses are designed to have a heavier student workload. My children took grade 10 physical education online. The course included 50 hours of writing assignments, three essays, 10 quizzes, two projects, three discussions, and more. They had to log and prove 75 hours of physical activity but the 50 hours of writing absolutely floored them. The kids learn more about the vocabulary of soccer, but not how to actually play it. The school justified the excessive writing component by saying they had to give more marked assignments because of the lack of face-to-face -face visual cues of absorption and feedback that they would receive from an in-person class. This lack of trust in online students contradicts the usefulness of such courses. Understandably, teachers need output to prove learning, but such excessive written output for a physical education course literally has no context or value. Number 15, some components of learning are harder to accomplish on a screen. Math characters, for example, Unless one has a math keyboard, it takes so many more keystrokes to write exponents, fractions, and other characters. It's also harder to do group and collaborative work by computer than by meeting in person to discuss a project and organize a workload. And lastly, 16, poorly organized courses. Course efficiency and organization depends on the learning style of the course developer. <laughs> Some courses are structured in a very orderly, <coughs> orderly, linear manner and come with clear instructions and checklists. The assignments are easy to navigate and the due dates are clear. Other courses are scattered and unorganized with assignments here, additional links there, hidden labs somewhere else, and too much visual overload. My children took an art course that was so poorly outlined that they missed deadlines because links were hidden. It may have worked for the course developer's learning style, but it did not work for my linear kids. It's easy for a child to lose vital bit of information such as instructions to reprogram their graphing calculators because the test supervisors will clear it before your exam. And if you don't, your answers will be incorrect. As more and more of our lives are dictated by online instruction, we need more simplicity and clarity. We don't need clutter. A book is linear. Online courses can be a scattered mess. So those are the 16 disadvantages of online learning. Of course, there are some advantages too, and it would be fair to go through those. There are distinct advantages to online learning. Number one, it's portable. The portal can be accessed and assignments submitted from anywhere in the world, which is good. Caution though, learners must account for different time zones for live tutorials or video instruction. Number two, Textbooks can be outdated, but online content is easier to update and correct. 
if someone's there to do it. <laughs> Number three, videos and recorded webinars can be watched repeatedly, which is nice. If a child doesn't get a concept, they can watch it over and over again. Number four, kids can ask questions anonymously. When they raise their hand virtually, classmates cannot see the hand nor hear the question. So it encourages children to ask questions without fear of embarrassment or ridicule from peers. Number five, students do not need to socialize with classmates. They avoid being subjected to bullying. This is a relief for introverts who just want to concentrate on the learning. Number six, it's ideal for people with barriers that prevent physical participation. Lack of childcare, mobility issues, transportation difficulties, and others. Number seven, it works for visual and auditory learners. Number eight, students can work ahead or fall slightly behind within reason. Some teachers put the entire course at once, which is great for big picture learners. However, many teachers will post the course in sections. Number nine, learners do not have to sign up for the whole full-time school package to get a teacher taught course. In 10, learning is borderless. Learners can access courses that originate in other countries if they would feel they'd be better served. So if kids are gonna spend more of their time at school online, why not just stay home and pursue their own agenda on their own schedule? No matter what textbooks learners read or which online course they take, they will learn enough math, biology, and literature to pass their exit exams or post-secondary entrance exams if they choose that direction. If the internet were to become the main learner-centered educational hub, schools could provide valuable support as centers for teacher and tutorial help, supervised field trip coordination, technology support, and resource lending libraries. Post-secondary schools could provide the benchmark accreditation for getting accepted, and learners could learn anywhere. If children are just going to read text off a screen, it should be text of their own choosing. Internet would be the institution. Schools would be the support, not the other way around. Thank you for joining us for this session. Keep in touch.